Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be talking about an article that Deloitte uh, put out, uh, I guess it was last year, on on the, the CIO survey of 2018. And uh, I wanted to give some comments to that. Uh, there was a follow-on article that was published in May about how system architecture will be uh, the most important area of, of the uh, IT departments in the coming years. Uh, stay tuned right after this. I think I probably confuse a lot of people on this channel because some of them think I'm a programmer, some of them think I'm a sysadmin, some of them think that I'm an operations, some think that I'm in, I don't, they don't know what I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, system architecture kind of is an umbrella over all of that. So, but is it a science? Is it art? Is it finesse? This is just junk, worthless. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, I wanted to talk about a little bit about this uh, survey a little bit. One of the quotes in there was kind of interesting. It says that uh, one of the CIOs said that he prefers that we provide the link between technology and business performance while relying on external partners for technological capabilities. Well, I don't see how you can do that. That's a conflict. Um, the external partners are going to be motivated by profit, and they're going to be motivated to either making you spend more than you need to or they're going to be uh, motivated to sell you something that maybe you don't need, but convince you that you do. So I don't think that's a good strategy, but that's just my opinion. Another quote from a CIO is, IT is being asked uh, into business discussions as a partner. Well, that's something that we've always wanted, right? I mean, that, I mean, as far as IT is concerned, we've always wanted to be a part of the business. But in order to play that role, you need to really understand the facets of the business that you are supporting because IT is a support role. You need to have as much knowledge, at least a base knowledge, of those areas of, if it's not your business, then the businesses that you are supporting external to your company. Uh, and the third item they talked about in here was, and this was the biggest worry that the CIOs have, is that these small startup companies are rapidly disrupting the older ones that have large IT infrastructures, complex systems, and uh, that have no future-proof designs. That is, uh, they're expensive to maintain and expensive to change. You know, uh, but my comment to that is, whose fault's that? I mean, the fact that you have complex systems and they're not future-proof, that indicates that you're in a mode of maintaining your systems and not growing your systems. Just saying. Some of the facts in the Deloitte uh, 2018 surveys of CIOs, there was 1,450 plus respondents and the big surprise, well, it wasn't really a big surprise to me, but it said 54% of them said they did not believe that their current systems would meet the current and future needs of their business. Wow. Now, in baseball, that would be a pretty good batting average. But in business, I would call that a failure. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know if the CIOs are looking at maybe predecessors as the blame for that. But, you know, they're the ones sitting in the driver's seat. Why is that? I mean, they really they need to answer that question themselves is why are their systems in that kind of a state? And in fact, the whole entire IT department ought to stand up and answer that question. So, yeah, let's talk about complexity for a moment. Yeah, it's a bad idea. Uh, just like this guy that's, trying, that's tied himself to, a, is riding a bicycle tied to the wing of a plane. That's only going to end in disaster. So, yeah, that's a bad idea. Complexity, bad. Simpl uh, court, and this is Edgar Dykstra. Um, he said that simplicity is a great virtue, but it requires hard work to achieve it and education to appreciate it. And to make matters worse, um, complexity sells better. And that sure is true. I've seen that many times. If you have two products of equal capability, the customer will always pick the more complex one because they associate complexity with power. And that's unfortunate because it's actually the opposite. It's the, the things that are more simple to operate are actually more powerful than the junked up complexity ones that have very little thought put into them. 
Yeah, complexity is not a desired state. It's usually the result of entropy uh, within the system's uh, code itself. Over time, it develops. It gets there's changes made without any thought, with all right, you know, with that, without any uh, thought or effort given to see if that code might already be in it. It just somebody will go in and slap on something and hope that it works because they don't have a lot of time to fix it. Uh, and cybernetics showed a long time ago, there was, uh, I, th I think, some studies that were done um, quite a long time ago that, that showed that there was a threshold, a point where the human mind can't cope any longer with increasing complexity and just kind of shuts down. Uh, they're no longer able to make uh, uh, intelligent decisions once the complexity level. It's called, I mean, we call it, you know, the, their eyes are rolling back in their head. Uh, but it, when you reach that level of complexity, you've lost the people that need to make the decisions about the systems. So it's really bad from, a, from two different perspectives. So yeah, the other one is, uh, this, is my, this is my tenant, fast, cheap, or good, pick any two. Um, fast and good, very expensive. Fast and cheap, <laughs> not any good. <laughs> it's not something you're probably going to want. Cheap and good, not happening anytime soon. Those take time to build. And uh, good, fast, and cheap, that's hallucination. Uh, I've seen a lot of managers that say, oh, I want all three. Good luck. You'll never get it. Um, you're just dreaming. And uh, Sometimes an architect, went, like I, I got called in one time to go look at a customer problem because they, I didn't know the customer. I hadn't worked with them before. They just wanted a fresh set of eyes to look at it. Someone would come in and, and just take a look at it and, and see what was going on with it and see what their impressions were. And so I went down and uh, I spent, I think it was a couple of weeks there looking at the problem. And, and I asked them, the first thing I always do is, okay, what's the problem? And it was taking 24 to 48 hours to process orders. This is an aircraft manufacturer. This is for military aircraft. And those are not simple. There are a lot of pieces in a military aircraft. Um, so I asked them one question, how long did it used to take? And they told me, oh, about four to six hours. And I was like, wow, that's a huge difference. And, uh, and so I dug into it a little bit. I, I didn't give an answer right away. I said, well, let me take a look and uh, we'll see what's going on with the software. And so we kind of ran through some simulated orders that were similar to ones that they were piling onto it at night and quickly surfaced a, a, a systemic design problem with the software. And there wasn't going to be something to fix because it was right at the core of it. It was choking itself to death on messaging that it was sending back and forth. Um, so I suggested, you know, I said... Uh, so why are you using this new system? And then they just kind of looked at me dumbfounded, like, why would you say that? Aren't are you from the company that's selling this thing? Is it, yeah, I am, but why are you using this thing? Uh, and I told them about the problem. I told them what was going on with it. And they said, what do you recommend we do? And I said, well, I think, I mean, I think, in all honesty, I think what we ought to do, since your software is better, let's move back to it and put it on the new hardware that this stuff was supposed to run on. And, and they were, and again, they were like, well, if you think that is the right answer, and I said, I don't think they're going to fix that in the time before you go out of business. Um, so uh, it took us about six weeks to get it done and tested and made sure it was all working fine. Not only did you get back to the four to six hours, we got down to 30 minutes. So they were happy. They were very happy. My employer, however, was not very happy. But, you know, hey, the customer trusted me, but, you know, salespeople, they're not history majors, so they don't remember anything after a year. So, uh, yeah, they forgot all about it because they were off to try to make new numbers for the next year. But, oh, well, at least the customer was happy, and that's all that matters to me. If you're working for somebody and they're paying you, that's who you work for. And that's I had to tell my boss that because uh, she asked. She said, how come you did that? And I said, well, I work for them, not you, and they're paying me. And I went down to see what the problem was, and that was the quickest solution that we had come up with, and they agreed it was. So that's what we did. And she was not happy, but I said, you know, I said, did you want to lose the customer? And, and then she kind of quieted down. Uh, yeah, that's more important. Keep the customer. Maybe you lose a sale. That's all right. Uh, simplicity. Uh, there isn't a one-size system that fits all. I mean, you can't just, there's a lot of these guys that have been publishing books for years and years that say, this is the way to do things. This is the way, and then, then three years later it changes, then three years later it changes. Um, yeah, there's no one-size thing that's going to fit every problem that somebody has because you know, it's back to the old adage, if all you know how to use is a hammer, then everything starts to look like a nail. 
Uh, instead, you want to build your systems in accordance with the, what the problem is you're trying to solve and the design constraints you have to work within. But keep in mind that you're going to try to build this thing in an, in an environment today where there's rapid change that's around you. So you have to be uh, you have to plan that into the system. So you have I mean there's process changes, there's system changes, there's hardware changes, there's even management changes that occur. And some of their pet projects may be thrown out of the window by the next manager that comes in that doesn't want to spend the money to support it. So, yeah, you want to build for that. And uh, keeping it simple makes it a lot easier to move to something new or to change something. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting microarchitecture so much. Uh, I think microservices can go too far. I mean, you can get so small down in the weeds that you're, that you're just flipping messages around so fast that you're not doing anything, any useful work. What I'm talking about is simplicity from the standpoint of component, and components should be married to functions. Sorry, but that works, <laughs> and it always has. It might be old-fashioned, but that is a, that is a design that has proven over, tr over many, many years that works. Uh, microservices architectures have their have their purposes, not, but again, it's not a one size fits all. Um, the other advice I have is uh, leave your pet theories and your pet solutions at home. This isn't a place to go try out new ideas. Uh, if you want to explore those, set up a lab, get some funding, try them out, see how well they're going to perform against something that's that is currently in in work. It's currently working. Uh, but the biggest piece of advice I have to give to new architects is, is for the, at least for your first initial meeting, keep your questions focused on the pro trying to understand the problem and shut up and listen. Don't jump to a conclusion. Don't start spouting out, here's how to solve the problem. It's natural for us to do that, but you'll miss finding out what the root cause of the problems are. And maybe there's other issues surrounding it that you don't know about and you won't know about until you start building a solution. So, yeah, at least for the first couple of days, tell the customer you're going to be listening and you're going to be asking focused questions to get at that problem. You want to know more about it. You want to know every aspect of it and where it is impacting them and also where it's originating. So the other problem you have is you got time frames, budget, and expectations that you got to manage. Um, time frames used to be and budgets used to be determined by IT when I started because IT owned everything as far as uh, the services within the uh, room. But as time went on, the user department started paying for it. Well, whoever pays for it is the one that 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 dictates what gets done. And so they will tell you. And I've heard so many people over my over the past few years. Uh, in the later years was, well, why do they get to choose how long this is going to take? Because they're paying for it. That's all they can afford. So you're going to have to, you're going to, have to figure out, based on what they're trying to ask you to do, what you can accomplish. They might give you a laundry list of things they want done, and you're going to have to be prepared to go back and negotiate with them to say, hey, uh, in the time and, and budget that you have outlined here, this is what I can accomplish. I can do these at some other point down the road if you want when you have the budget and the time frames to support it. But, I, you know, you, you need to pick and choose on this list. Here's some things I suggest we do. These are the major problems that you uh, indicated. I think we should do those first. And then if we have time left over in the budget, let's go work on some of the other ones. Or maybe we postpone them until we can get to them in the future. But let's get these big ones fixed first. And make and let them let them come back and negotiate on, with you until you're all in agreement, because they have to ultimately own it. You can't do that. You're not paying for it. They are, so and, it, and it's not your money. <laughs> it's theirs. Um, the other thing, this is the most difficult thing, is you have to design the system to fit the problem. Uh, if you don't do that, then you're going to end up with either one of two things. If it doesn't fit the problem, you're going to start bolting things on it to fix. It's going to like a bad pipe leak. You start patching it here and here and here, and it then it becomes more complex. You don't want that. You want a simple a pro, a fix to the problem, a simple a fit to the problem as you can, in order to get to the end state. Uh, that doesn't mean that you you know it's it's uh, it's the Zen architecture. Is no, it's the right architecture. It's whatever you need to do to get the job done. Uh, you should be working on a fix, not worrying about something that's cool that you want to show off. Mm -mm, that's not the time to do it. Uh, again, if you have something cool, get a budget, go to the lab, go figure it out. Uh, but don't make your don't make your customer a, a science experiment. Sometimes the solution is obvious, 
Most of the time, it's just hard work trying to figure it out. You can't get around that. You've got to do your homework. You've got to do the engineering. You've got to do the math. I remember, I remember one time, uh, a general, and I'm not kidding, this is a true story. A general came to the company I was working for and said that he wanted a phaser. And he was dead serious. He wanted a phaser. And you, know, and you can't laugh at a general, even though we wanted to. We couldn't laugh at him. And we, and we, we said, um, okay, well, let's, let's work on what you think the specs should be for it, and, uh, and we'll design it and come back to you with a cost. And that's what we did. And that's a, that, is a, that is a true story, and that story is still used to teach uh, future system engineers how to deal with problems like that. I mean, e even if you know that it's unlikely that that would be a economically feasible thing to build, because I think they came out with something like a, a terawatt of energy to be developed to produce this thing that would generate enough power to, to be like a Star Trek phaser. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't a joke to the general, and you can't treat it as such. They're your customer. Uh, but you have to come back with a reasonable amount of engineering and then show them what the cost will be and let them make the decision. And when he saw the price tag, he was like, okay, I guess we will go and look at something else. And so, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was really trying to explore the technology. He wasn't an engineer. I mean, that wasn't his job. That wasn't what he was doing. But he expected us to answer that question for him. And he wasn't going to just take, are you nuts for an answer? He wasn't going to take that. So, yeah, sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's just hard work. Um, yeah, wake up. Architects, this is a quote from a CIO out of that Deloitte uh, uh, survey. Architects will be expected to be both technically specialized and more attuned to the enterprise-wide landscape. The way I interpret that is not only do they expect someone that understands the technology, they want someone that knows the business that they're dealing with. And they want a specialized architect that is dealing with payroll, accounts payable, order delivery, inventory control, artificial intelligence, data mining, uh, all of those things, right? Machine learning, all of those areas, they're going to expect an expert, but they also want that expert to understand the area of the business that they'll be working with. That's a rare commodity, and that's somebody they'll have to spend quite a bit of time in those user departments to really figure it out, at least on a base level. Uh, yeah, anyway, and if you fail to do that, yeah, you're going to be a part of the enterprise-wide landscape as in planted somewhere out in the, uh, in the uh, greenery outside <laughs> of your building. Um, don't expect the status quo to last, remain so for long. It won't last. Uh, your competition will eat you for breakfast if you stay stay uh, you stay still for long. I mean, it is a you know it's, it's the survival of the fittest. It isn't the survival of the biggest. It is who is fit, who is strong, and and those that are big and weak are going to fall. Um, that's the nature of things. But you don't want to be the disruptee. You want to be the disruptor. That's all I had today. That's my, my simplified advice without writing a book on models and, and engineering equations and all the things you need to learn in addition to that. There are speeds and feeds you have to worry about. But, you know, from the business perspective, in order to solve a problem, you really got to get wrapped around it. We used to do, uh, we used to do these week-long week -long, uh, uh, interviews with the customer that we were working with uh, in order to understand uh, their expectations and who the business owners were and what, what and try to gather up what they wanted it to, to accomplish. It's not a bad idea, right? Got to know where you're going. Anyway, that's all I had today. Hope you enjoyed that and uh, hope to see you all again real soon and bye for now.